welcome to IOSIS Insights, where we unlock knowledge to the world. Today, I'm pleased to interview Dr. Ursula Voigt from the Durban University of Technology in South Africa, who is the author of the book titled The Great Gatsby Meets Alain Badu, Rethinking Fidelity in Film Adaptation. We'll be discussing this book's contribution to the specific scientific discourse. Dr. Voer, <clears throat> it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, thank you so much, Lorica. Um, it's a pleasure to be here as well. Can you tell our viewers a bit about yourself and your involvement mm -hmm. in this field of study? Yeah, so um, at the present, I'm a lecturer at the University, Durban University of Technology um, in the Department of Media, Language and Communication. Um, to talk a bit about my interest in this field of study, I realized it really goes back quite a long way. I've got quite a diverse background, but I think that really expresses how interdisciplinary the field of adaptation studies is. So what happened was initially I wanted to be an illustrator and I went to university and I studied fine art. Um, and then I was also very interested in English literature. And so I eventually left art and did literature and then when I graduated, I did an illustrating course. So I didn't want to be a fine artist. I wanted to be an illustrator. And when you illustrate, in a way, you're already adapting a text. So as part of that illustration course, um, I decided I was going to do a graphic novel adaptation of Hamlet. And then I did a bit of Macbeth as well. So uh, during that, I really learned about adapting and how to put something into visual form that later on became very useful when I was studying film. So having done that, I then took a change in direction. I went to the UK and I started working in corporate communications, um, drawing on my English skills. And then I was studying, doing evening study through London University. And again, um, for my higher degrees, I came across the idea of adaptation. And um, I looked at the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was, you know, my favorite author, and how his work had been adapted into film. Um, so when I came back to South Africa and I drew more on my academic education and my media and cultural studies masters, um, I decided to do my PhD in adaptation. So it really was this kind of abiding interest throughout my life in how um, texts, how people respond to texts, how they adapt texts, how they work with texts. Um, so, yeah. And then I, um, you know, around about the turn of the century, I came across the work of Alain Badur, a French philosopher who wrote about fidelity. And I thought that's really interesting to apply to adaptation. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> now let's talk about this book's contribution to the field. How <clears throat> does it contribute to fidelity in film adaptation and what impact do you hope it will have? Okay, so um, the field of film adaptation, fidelity has always been a, a key debate. So right from the beginning, when people started talking about adaptation, really, you know, um, kind of around the middle of the 20th century, when um, critical theorists started talking about it, um, this issue of fidelity came up because it's something really fundamental about an adaptation. How does it relate to the original? I mean, it, it actually speaks to what an adaptation is. It's not something that stands completely alone. It has some kind of inspiration or relationship with an original text. And if that text is very well known, you know, Pride and Prejudice is an example of a book that is often adapted, then people have an idea about that text, what they think it is, what they want to see. So um, in the early days of this criticism, there was a lot of what later became known as fidelity criticism, where you would kind of look at the film, look at the book and work out why does the film not, why isn't it as good as this great work of art that is the book? So this, people got very tired of reading this kind of thing because they were like, well, 
The film's always at a disadvantage because you're dealing with something that is culturally revered, this book that was so great, you know? So they wanted to get away from that kind of thinking. Um, so it actually became such a dirty word in the field, um, fidelity, because the minute you you said it, people thought you were just going to be like, oh, well, the film is not as good as the book, and here's why I think so. Um, and yeah, it, it really um, became so like you read a lot of articles from the later half of the 20th century where they start off by saying, I am not doing fidelity criticism. Fidelity is not a good way to look at adaptations. So it really, um, in my book, the first chapter is really looking at those kind of trends in criticism. Um, and they really go alongside trends in um, the academy, you know? So when people moved away from structuralism, empiricism, these kind of very firm ideas to more ideas of, you know, how you see things depends on your position, um, these more kind of postmodern ideas kind of fidelity went out with that. So in, in many ways, what we do is a response to fashion in academia as well as everything else. So instead of fidelity, people chose to talk about intertextuality. In other words, how every text has a relationship with other texts. Um, so this was kind of a solution to the problem of saying the book is always going to be better than the film. Um, because now you are just looking at their relationships. Um, or people try to rescue parts of the idea of fidelity by saying, actually, it's it's still useful to look at infidelity. Like, why did they change the ending in the film to make it more palatable? That's like a political act. So that you can look at that and you're not doing fidelity criticism. You're not just saying that the film is a poor reflection of the book. So there were certain attempts around um, changing the kind of narrative. But around about the turn of the 21st century, the start of the century, people started to say, hang on a moment. Um, what happened was postmodernism kind of overreached itself. It became so that everything was relative and nothing was, you couldn't find any solid ground anymore. Because if everything becomes relative, it becomes very hard to um, argue for anything, basically. So postmodernism kind of overreached itself and um, people started getting interested again in ideas of truthfulness. And um, it was actually at around that time that the writings of Alain Bourdieu, um became translated into English. Um, although he had been writing in France since the 60s, but um, his work started being translated into English just around um, the turn of the century. And then his ideas, you know, became more popular as they managed to have a greater reach. So I happened to come across his work and I thought, you know, he has a concept of fidelity that's really quite different from the commonly held idea of fidelity. So the commonly held idea of fidelity, it's the idea almost like copying, right? You know, you have this book, you're going to copy it and make an adaptation that's as much like it as possible. So that's problematic because film and books are two different things and they're never going to be the same. Um, and also this idea that you're committing some sort of moral outrage by <laughs> adapting something that was a great work of art. Um, so those kind of ideas of fidelity, the idea of loyalty to something, faithfulness, um, and the idea of copying were problematic. Um, so adding that moral element and people had a real problem with that. Um, so, but they couldn't help noticing that people did have these reactions to adaptation still. So it's kind of like something worth talking about. Why do they have these reactions? So anyway, Alain Bourdieu's idea of fidelity was quite different um, and kind of seemed to me to resolve a lot of the issues in the field. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> it's, it's quite a complex system that he has, and I won't go into great detail. So the first book, I go into the background within the field of adaptation studies and kind of what got us to this point. And then in the next chapter, I talk about Alain Bourdieu's philosophical structure 
um, hopefully making it quite readable. Um, so he based his ideas on mathematical set theory, um, which um, said that there is always a part of the set that can't be counted. So things are grouped into sets, but there's always got to be something in that set that you can't count just logically speaking. So there's like an empty presence in the set. Um, so that actually helped to solve quite a lot of problems in mathematics. So Bajur thought, let's supply this to philosophy. Um, and he came up with this um, expression of how do things change in the world? So this is what he calls a truth event. So you have to get used to the fact that Bajur's terminology is a bit different from what we are used to, like the words such as truth is defined in his own terms, fidelity is defined in his own terms. So for him, truth is not something like, okay, this is a computer, this is a table. He says that is just knowledge. There's nothing wrong with it, it's knowledge, okay? But truth is something that cannot be expressed. Um, it's something that causes changes in the world. So it's like explaining why, they, and they are global changes. So truths are universal, but they have to be brought into existence. Okay. Um, so they're both made and discovered at the same time. So for him, and he gives examples of these truth events, um, things like the French Revolution, which changed a lot of things, um, the conversion of St. Paul, um, the idea of Christianity, he's he's a complete atheist, but he talks about that Christianity is a truth event because it, it created global changes. Modernism is another truth event. Um, so I, in my book, I look at Fitzgerald as a kind of expression of the truth event of modernism. Because you, if you think about it, modernism also changed things throughout the world. It changed art. It changed literature, it changed um, technology. It, it like had this huge effect. So it was a, a, what a bedewing truth event. So he talks a bit about how these truths can happen or be allowed to express themselves. Um, and for him, it's all about allowing the contradiction in the set to operate. So that part of the set that can't, that doesn't fit, that can't be expressed. Um, must be allowed to speak. So that is the opposite of a kind of idea of copying, because when you're copying, you're trying to pin things down and make things the same. But he says that you have to be open to this kind of sense of contradiction that can then allow a truth to express itself. So, you know, that is key. Um, so that is one aspect. Another aspect is that you know, you have to address it universally, even though you experience it individually. So it's it's all about having this authentic reaction to something, this authentic orientation towards what he calls the set. Um, so he'll say that everything in um, the world is ordered into sets in a sense, like, you know, um, for example, the fact that you what he calls the world of presentation. Um, you have a country, there are people in it, for example. But then he says there's also something called representation, representation, where we say, okay, this is the state of France. This country, we've given it this group. Okay, we've put it into a group. And then the example that many people use to explain his concepts, which I think is quite a good one, is that he says there is the French state, but there are people in the French state who are stateless. So how can they be both there and not there? That is an example of that kind of element in the set that is present, but not um, visible. And that is the place where a truth event can happen, where there can be some kind of change or revolution. So when you so I, I thought these were really interesting ideas. It took a lot of the difficulties out of this idea of fidelity because it becomes about approaching something in the right spirit, basically. Um, it's not about trying to replicate something because straight away then what you're doing is you're representing, you're trying to close down the set instead of keeping it open. You know, you're putting a form onto something and saying it must um, fit that. 
And the whole point about his series to kind of come and be open to something. So um, in the after I've discussed like the Bajuring framework, I then talk about Fitzgerald and the Great Gatsby and how it expresses the truth event of modernism. So even though you cannot say what a truth is in Bajur, but you can see its effects, the effects that it's had, that the kind of effect that modernism had on the world. And the Gatsby, I take Gatsby as one of the expressions of that, because he says when a new truth comes, you need to find new names, new ways of describing it, um, because it's something that didn't exist before. So you find new methods to kind of express it. Um, whether those be new technologies or new words or new new images. Um, so I talk about Gatsby in that sense. And then I also talk about how you can apply Bajur's ideas to film. And he himself wrote quite a lot about film. He was very interested in film. Um, but of course, I'm not just talking about film, I'm talking about adaptation. So I take it a little bit further and think, how does this apply? You know, not just to a film where he talks about the kind of difficulties films run into when trying to create this truth, which is things like, you know, being overly, basically overly structured, overly plotted or being obsessed with the visual image. So everything is like perfect and you're just caught up in the image and nothing else. So he, he kind of writes these quite sort of, um, loose ideas about film and then I take that and look at adaptation as a particular example of trying to hark back to a truth event that was previously there like he says you can do that you can express it um, you can express what happened in the past um, so I then start looking at the films of Gatsby and I put together methodology based on these ideas which is very much centered around the idea of how you approach an adaptation. So, um, you know, the directors had a certain approach to the films. Um, the actors perhaps had a certain idea. Um, the audience had a certain idea of what they were going to see or what they wanted to see. The reviewers had a certain idea. So um, I then start looking at the four Hollywood adaptations of The Great Gatsby. There was one in 1926, which has been lost, sadly. Um, but we do have the trailer, so we get an idea of it. Um, so that was just after Gatsby came out, the next year or so. Um, and then the next one was in 1949, I think. <laughs> if I'm getting the dates exactly right, um, which was with Alan Ladd as um, Gatsby, and then the 1974 version, which was very well known to most people with Robert Redford. And 2013, you had Baz Luhrmann's version with Leonardo DiCaprio playing Gatsby. So what I do then is I take a look at what were the directors? What did they say about how they went into this? Were they approaching it in the in a kind of perduring spirit of fidelity or what was their kind of goals and I mean there's some really fun kind of interviews you read um the obviously the ones where the film was not a success like the 1974 version lost a lot of money um the director and the producer kind of tore you know the producer was the writer was Francis Ford Coppola and he kind of tore the director apart in interviews in a very ungenerous kind of way um, but it makes the interviews interesting reading <laughs> and then the director was much more gentlemanly about his contribution but yeah there was quite a blame game that went on um, Baz Luhrmann also quite openly said like he tried to read the book couldn't get on with it listen to the audio book and then he then he felt um you know, this was something that inspired him. So there's kind of, they give quite a lot of information about their approaches. The director in 1940 was completely overwhelmed by the thought of filming what he said he thought was the greatest American novel. 
So again, that expresses what there is about adaptation, that that feeling of trying to do justice. So he went in there thinking, this is the greatest American novel. I can't like adapt it. So again, that would work against like a sort of authentic response to it because you're, you're trying to, um, you know, do something that is kind of the same as what Fitzgerald did or you feel you can't uh, right from the off. So I look at all those what we call paratexts, texts that happened around the film. I look at how the films were marketed um, because especially in 1974, they spent so much money on this film. There were various things that happened that made it more expensive that they went kind of crazy just trying to get people through the doors. And they created so much hype around the film and they tried to sell it as a romance, which it's not a very satisfying romance, The Great Gatsby, um, because the people in it are so unpleasant, you know, especially the object of desire, Daisy. She's not a very nice kind of character. Um, and it's got this quite disturbing ending. Um, so they tried to sell it as, you know, escapist glamour romance. And they got people through the doors, but nobody went back to see it again. And it was not a financial success. Um, and yeah, people were really turned off by the hype. They they really were angry that they weren't getting what they had been promised, you know? So they again were going into the film with this idea they were bringing... Um, they were kind of bringing the structure to the set because they had an idea of what they wanted to see. So they were also not going in being open to whatever truths the movie might manage to articulate. Um, and then, yeah, we I also look at the reviewers because they kind of express popular opinion, you know. So I look at the marketing, I look at the reviews um, just to see, and you know, was there a consensus, was there... Um, disagreements you know there's a remarkable degree of consensus about the 1970s version and some of those reviews are quite quite funny to read because they really sharpened their knives um and in 2013 there was kind of a lot of not sure you know we're going to see how this plays out it might be a hit it might not and then it actually did it was considered a financial success that film so um but yeah, it's it's interesting to see how the reviewers reacted. Um, and then I look at the films themselves because, you know, you can say one thing, but you can do another. So I look at the films and, you know, look at the choices that were made. What was left in, left out? Um, just because that shows your approach to the film. You know, it's not a matter of saying, is it the same as the book? But it's, it's rather illustrating um, how you approach the, the the themes. So, yeah, um, to sum up, um, basically it's taking Alain Badur's idea of fidelity and applying it to adaptation studies, and I feel like it resolves some of the problems that people had had with that concept of fidelity, because it moves it away from the idea of copying, takes away its kind of moral dimensions, and um, instead it becomes about being open to contradiction and especially um, those elements in the text um, or the film that don't, that aren't pin downable to allow those to speak. Um, films are very structured in comparison to books and it, it, there's quite an art to directing something and allowing that to happen. Uh, for the viewers who are keen on exploring this book, we invite you to visit our website at books.aosis.co.za. We will be able to access and download the open access PDF. To publish a work with Aosis, download the electronic book proposal form from our website, register your profile on our website and submit your proposal for consideration. It has been a pleasure having you with us today, Dr. Voigt. Thank you for it's taking the time. Lovely to be here. Thanks so much, great. Larika.